morning, everybody. I think we'll get, we'll get started and more people will come. So thanks for coming. Um, we are lucky today to have Dr. Daniel Sims from Montefiore. So Dr. Sims is an um, associate professor of medicine at Montefiore Medical Center at the Science College of Medicine. Um, Dr. Sims um, did his med school and uh, residency at Emory. He did his cardiology fellowship um, at Columbia and completed his advanced heart transplant, I'm sorry, advanced heart failure training there as well. Um, Dr. Sims now is medical director of the cardiac intensive care unit at um, Montefiore and uh, is a member of the cardiac transplant and LVAD team. Um, Dr. Sims now uh, research focuses in heart failure shock, LVAD, and he's here to talk about um, uh, an update in um, management of outpatient heart failure. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Kenny. Appreciate it. It's really uh, great to be here today. Uh, thank you all for being here early. So, um, disclosures, I'm a Mets fan, which uh, if you work in the Bronx, uh, that actually is a big disclosure to be a Mets fan and not a Yankee fan. Uh, otherwise, uh, no disclosures. So, uh, objectives today, I want to review the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, review data on ACE inhibitors and ARVs for the treatment of chronic systolic heart failure, present newer data on nephrolysin inhibitors, what we call RNAs, recognize when to refer a patient to a heart failure specialist, and then introduce the current state of advanced heart failure therapies. So, no talk about heart failure can be complete without uh, going over some of the heart failure statistics, and, and they're really staggering. There's 6.5 million people in the U.S. over the age of 20 that have heart failure currently. The expected prevalence will increase by 46% in 2030 to over 8 million people with heart failure. There's a million new diagnoses of heart failure each year, 2.7 million office visits for heart failure, most of which are to the primary care setting. Uh, 900,000 hospital discharges for heart failure. In 2015, heart failure was the underlying cause of death for 75,000 people. There's more Medicare dollars that are spent on the diagnosis and treatment of heart failure than any other disease, including diabetes. And the estimated cost for heart failure in 2012 was $30 billion, and it's expected to increase in 2030 to $69.7 billion. So heart failure is incredibly common, it's incredibly morbid, and it's incredibly expensive. Fortunately, though, we have good medical therapy for heart failure. And this slide is uh, from my partner, uh, Uli Yorde, who uh, is the head of our heart failure transplant program, and actually uh, was a resident here at uh, Mount Sinai uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And what this slide shows is that back in the early 80s, when you really didn't have treatment for heart failure that modified the disease process, all you had were diuretics and digoxin, which did not change mortality at all. If you had New York Heart Association class four heart failure, so you were short of breath at rest, your one-year mortality was 54%. So over half the patients were dead at one year. So 1986 comes along in the publication of the consensus trial with the Naloprel, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth later on. And ACE inhibitor reduced the uh, yearly mortality to 39%. You add in beta blockers from the Merit HF study, mortality was down to 18%. Spironolactone in the RAIL study, 19% uh, mortality. If you combine ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist for enolactone uh, in the Copernicus study, and mortality for New York Heart Association class 4 heart failure was down to 11%. So that's almost a 50% reduction in the yearly mortality rate. A number needed to treat is two. So you treat two people per year to save a life with just three pills. So really, really remarkable. So we know about these medications by our understanding of the neurohormonal model for heart failure. And I want to spend a moment going over that. So we start with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And you have angiotensin II interacting with its receptor, which causes vasoconstriction. This leads to increased blood pressure, increased sympathetic tone, aldosterone secretion, and at the level of myocytes, hypertrophy and fibrosis. But also, there's activation of the sympathetic nervous system via epinephrine and norepinephrine at the level of the beta and alpha receptors, which also causes vasoconstriction, further upregulation of the RAS uh, system, increase in vasopressin, which is a potent vasoconstrictor uh, secretion, increase in your heart rate, and increase in contractility, which is actually maladaptive. Now, there's another part of the neurohormonal model. 
that's actually beneficial, and that's a natriuretic peptide system. And we think about uh, B-type natriuretic peptide, but there are other ones too, and those interact with their receptor and lead to vasodilation, which is obviously beneficial, it lowers blood pressure, decreases sympathetic tone, causes naturesis and diuresis, leads to decreased vasopressin and aldosterone secretion, as well as decreased fibrosis and hypertrophy. So let's talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in a little bit more detail. So you have angiotensinogen, which is cleaved by renin to angiotensin 1, and then the angiotensin converting enzyme turns ang1 into ang2. And ang2 works at the level of the uh, peripheral smooth muscle and uh, the vasculature to increase afterload. ANG2 also causes increased stimulation of aldosterone secretion, which causes sodium and uh, water retention at the level of the kidney. So what collectively these are doing is it's increasing preload and increasing afterload, which is not very good when you're talking about heart failure because our therapies would want to decrease preload and decrease afterload. So let's talk about our therapies. So ACE inhibitors, they're beneficial, they decrease the rates of death, and they improve symptoms, and they prevent hospitalizations. Most of our data with ACE inhibitors is for enalapril, but a class effect has been observed. There's never really um, been an ACE inhibitor that's not been shown to be beneficial for heart failure, which is very different for beta blockers, where only metoprolol XL, um, uh, arbetalol, and bisoprolol have proven to be beneficial for heart failure. In the trials, uh, both short and long term, about 90% of patients are able to tolerate being on the drug. Now, higher doses of ACE inhibitors have been shown to be beneficial for preventing hospitalization, but <clears throat> they really didn't have any improvement in mortality, just a trend. So if you have a patient who's only able to tolerate, say, 2.5 or 5 milligrams of lisinopril, that's just as good for improving mortality as if you were able to get them on 30 to 40 milligrams of lisinopril. So if you can get them on, sneak on just that little bit of ACE inhibitor, it's beneficial. Now, it's recommended the ACE inhibitors for all patients with heart failure with a low ejection fraction unless it's contraindicated. And the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, gives that a class one level of evidence A. So they should be on it, uh, and there's multiple randomized trials showing the benefit. So let's take a look at these trials uh, briefly. So I mentioned the consensus study. This is from way back in 1987. 100% of patients, every patient in the study had no heart association class four heart failure. 126 patients with placebo, 126 patients randomized to an allopril. Average blood pressure was 120 over 75. Medical therapy consisted of diuretics for 87% of patients, DIG for 93% of the patients. Remember, there wasn't much therapy for heart failure. Uh, vasodilators, namely hydralazine and isozorbide, in 46% of the patients. Only 3% of the patients were on beta blockers because this was the pre beta blocker era. And 41% of the patients were on potassium sparing diuretics. The mortality for placebo was 44% at six months and 26% for enalapril uh, at six months. So a 41% relative risk reduction, 18% absolute reduction. You can see in the kaplan meier curves just how profound uh, an improvement in survival giving enalapril was. So then the SOLID uh, study came out, and this looked at patients who weren't quite as sick. So 90% of the patients in the study were heart association class 2 or 3, but it was a very large study. 1,200 patients uh, got placebo, 1,200 patients got enalapril, average ejection fraction was 25%, average blood pressure 125 over 77, medical therapy was similar to previously, 85% on diuretics, two-thirds of the patients on digoxin, half the patients on vasodilators, very few patients on uh, beta blockers, and 30% of the patients were on calcium channel blockers, which we now consider to be contraindicated. Uh, in uh, systolic heart failure. And as you can see here, uh, mortality improved with enalapril for placebo is 39.7% in a year and 35.2% for enalapril or 16% relative risk reduction, 4.5% absolute risk reduction. So even in these less sick patients, there was still substantial benefit for being on an ACE inhibitor. Some practical points about ACE inhibitors. So it's contraindicated patients who have angiotensin contraindicated patients with renal failure, as well as patients who are pregnant. When you start an ACE inhibitor or you adjust the dose, you want to check a, uh, uh, renal function potassium in one to two weeks. And then also ACE inhibitors, if you're seeing a patient 
as the compensated card debtor. So they come into the office and their body overload is going to be edema. They tell you they're more short of breath than they usually are. It's okay to continue them on their ACE inhibitor or even start it as long as they're hemodynamically stable and they're not clinically unstable. So ACE inhibitors have some adverse effects and it's due to one of two things. It can be related to either angiotensin II suppression, which can cause hypotension, worsened renal function, hyperkalemia, or it can be due to increased uh, radiokinin production potentiation. So the ACE inhibitor prevents angiotensin I from becoming angiotensin II, but it also prevents the breakdown of bradykinin. And bradykinin is what leads to the ACE inhibitor cough that we see in about 20% of our patients, and it also can lead to angioedema, which fortunately you don't see that often, less than 1% of patients. So angiotensin receptor blockers were developed for people who couldn't tolerate uh, ACE inhibitors, and it prevents angiotensin II from binding to its receptor. Like ACE inhibitors, they've been proven beneficial for preventing death, for improving symptoms, and for preventing hospitalization. Now, while we have a bunch of data on uh, ARVs, there's not as much as there are for ACE inhibitors. And as a result, the uh, ACCHA has recommended ARVs for patients with heart failure induced EF who are intolerant to ACE inhibitors. So, the CHARM alternative study is probably our best study uh, looking at uh, ARVs for patients who couldn't tolerate uh, ACE inhibitors. So, um, in this study, uh, everybody who got into it couldn't be on an ACE for one reason or another. Two thirds of the patient was ACE inhibitor cough. The other third of the patients, they had had hypotension with an ACE inhibitor or they had renal failure. Some patients in the study, which we'll talk about in the next slide, actually did have angioedema previously. Average ejection fraction was 30%, average blood pressure 130 over 76. Now this trial was in Lancet in 2003, so a little bit better uh, medical therapy, background diuretics 85%, beta blockers 54%, because this was during the beta blocker uh, era, uh, digoxin uh, half the patients, and vasodilators about 42% of the patients. The primary endpoint in the study was cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, and the primary endpoint was reached in 40% of the patients uh, on placebo and 33% of the patients on candesartan for an absolute risk reduction of uh, 7% and a hazard ratio of 0.77. So as you can see again by the kaplan meier curves, huge improvement uh, if you were put on an ARB if you had been intolerant to the ACE inhibitor. Now, some practical points about the ARB, uh, minimal data on using ACE inhibitors and ARVs together, and there is good data not to use ACE inhibitors, ARVs, and lactone, all three of them together. There's a lot of renal failure, uh, a lot of hyperkinemia. Adverse events with ARVs similar to uh, ACE inhibitors, hypo excuse me, hypotension, hyperkalemia, renal failure, and then angioedema, I want to speak specifically about that. So in the CHARM alternative study, there were 39 patients in the arm that got randomized to get the ARB, uh, who had previously had angioedema. Okay? And of these thousand patients who got ARB, only three patients in the study got angioedema. So pretty darn rare. And all three of those, pre those patients actually previously had angioedema with an ACE inhibitor. Mm -hmm. So when we think about, oh, you know, they had angioedema with an ACE inhibitor, probably don't want to challenge them. It's actually pretty safe to challenge them. So if you have a good reason, you know, they've got symptomatic systolic heart failure, uh, your rates of having repeat angioedema are actually low and significant uh, life-threatening angioedema were very, very low. Right. One question. Mm -hmm. If you have someone with cough on ACE inhibitors, mm -hmm. is it, given the data is not quite as good with ARBs, is it ever worth switch, trying to switch them to a different ACE inhibitor so they're not tolerant to yeah, so, so the, the ACE inhibitor cough is a class effect, so they'll, yeah. they'll have that. So the, the thing to keep in mind is usually, you know, the cough could be due to the ACE inhibitor, or it could be that they actually are still in pulmonary edema, and uh, we just don't see the fluid that they have in their neck or in uh, their legs. Um, so I usually try both approaches, increasing their diuretics a little bit and switching them to an ARB. So a common question that often comes up um, is which do you start first, the ACE inhibitor or the beta blocker? So what I tell people is that if the patient's volume overloaded, to go with the ACE or the ARB first, 
because of the uh, hemodynamic effects, you get afterload reduction and then better vasodilation, which can improve them, uh, make it easier to compensate them. Otherwise, there's good data from the CBIS-3 study saying that it really doesn't matter whether you start the ACE or A or B first or you start the beta blocker first. So medical therapy is very good, but as I showed you in that introductory slide, our morbidity uh, and mortality are, are still uh, pretty bad. Okay, so we need newer therapies, we need better therapies. And that's where nephrolysin inhibitors come in. So what exactly is nephrolysin? Well, nephrolysin is what they call a neutral endopeptidase that inactivates multiple vasoactive peptides. And the chief among them are the natriuretic peptides, but also adrenomodulin, like mentally, excuse me, bradykinin, substance P, and angiotensin II. So for our patients with heart failure, we have upregulation of the natriuretic peptides. Okay? And from the heart, we secrete pro-BNP, which then gets cleaved to NT-pro-BNP, which I'm not sure which assay you guys use here is one of the things we measure, or to the other part of it, which is BNP, which is the active compound. And then there's also atrial natriuretic peptide, C natriuretic peptide. And all of these things cause vasodilation, lower blood pressure, decreasing the sympathetic tone, natriuresis, diuresis. Okay. But nephrolysin breaks down these substances and inactivates them. So when nephrolysin is present at high uh, concentrations, you're going to decrease all those beneficial effects that you're seeing. So you're not going to get these beneficial effects at the level you previously would. So if you inhibit nephrolysin, and secubitril is the prototype of the uh, nephrolysin inhibitors, which gets turned into the active form <coughs> in the body, something called LBQ657, then you'll get more vasodilation, lower blood pressure, you get all of these good properties in higher uh, amounts. Okay. So why then is it that we give it uh, with valsartan? Okay. So it's a cubitril with valsartan. Well, the nephrolysin, it does inhibit BMP, but it's also inhibiting uh, uh, angiotensin II. So it's breaking down angiotensin II. So if you inhibit nephrolysin, you're going to have higher levels, not just of BNP, but also angiotensin II, which is going to work at the angiotensin receptor and cause all these detrimental effects that we see in heart failure, basic restriction, higher blood pressure, uh, hypertrophy, fibrosis, sympathetic tone. So if you give the ARB, the angiotensin receptor blocker, you're preventing those deleterious effects of the uh, angiotensin II. So um, the prototype, uh, as I mentioned, is Secubitril combined with Valsartan. The uh, chemical name for the compound is LCZ696, so you'll see that in the literature. And then the brand name, which you see on TV, is Entresto. Okay? And it's a one-to-one -one molar ratio. And this is the biochemical structure, in case anybody's a biochemist in the audience. And the data that shows the benefit of uh, Secubitril Valsartan uh, comes to us mainly from the Paradigm study. And this is a, a really uh, groundbreaking study in heart failure. It's the largest heart failure study that was ever done, over 8,000 patients. Um, and it's really uh, has changed the paradigm for treatment of heart failure. So it was led by John McMurray at the uh, University of Glasgow and Milton Packer, who is uh, currently in Dallas. But he um, has been a real thought leader in heart failure for over 30 years. Uh, he did his cardiology fellowship here at Mount Sinai. He was on faculty at Mount Sinai for about 12 or 13 years uh, in the 80s and early 90s till, until he was recruited to Columbia. So who are the patients who were in paradigm? I think it's very important to go through this trial in a little bit of detail. So patients were over the age of 18. They all had near heart association class 2 to 4 heart failure, an ejection fraction less than 40%, which was later changed to less than 35%. A BNP that was greater than 150, or an NT pro BNP that was greater than 600. If they had a heart failure admission within the last year, then they could be on a slightly uh, lower level of uh, the natriuretic peptides. And the patients, importantly, had to be on a stable dose of beta blocker and the equivalent of an allopril of at least 10 milligrams a day for four weeks. So they wanted patients who were on good dosages of beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, stably for at least four weeks. Who couldn't be in the trial? Anyone who had symptomatic hypotension, if their blood pressure was less than 100 at screening or 95 at randomization, if they had renal dysfunction with an estimated GFR less than 30 at screening, or if it went down 
by 25% between screening and randomization. Anyone who had hyperkalemia with a potassium greater than 5.2 or 5.4 randomization, if they had a history of angioedema, if uh, they had unacceptable side effects previously to the ACE or ARB, because they wanted patients who would be able to tolerate the medications who were in the trial. If they currently were acutely decompensated in their heart failure, so this was an outpatient study, everyone had chronic systolic heart failure, nobody was acutely decompensated. If the patient had a, a recent acute coronary syndrome or recent stroke, if they had cabbage recently, if they had a PCI within the last three months, they couldn't be in the study, or if they had severe pulmonary disease. The protocol's a little interesting. So all the patients, remember, they were already on an ACE or an ARV, so they were switched single blind fashion to enalapril 10 milligrams of the ID for two weeks. So the patient didn't know what medicine they were on, but the doctors knew. Okay. Then, if they tolerated that, they were switched to Sacubitril Valsartan at 100 milligrams of the ID for four to six weeks. Again, single blind, the doctors knew the patients were on it, which was then increased to 200. So if the patients tolerated being on the ACE, being on the Sacubitril Valsartan, with no unacceptable side effects, then they were randomized one to one with an allopril 10 milligrams DID or Sacubitril Valsartan 200 DID in a double blind fashion. So neither the patient or the doctors knew what the patient was on, and they could reduce the dose if there were unacceptable side effects at this point in time. The primary outcome was a composite of death due to cardiovascular cause or first admission from heart failure, but there were also important secondary causes, time to death uh, from any cause. Uh, the change in the cardio, uh, Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, which is a uh, questionnaire that measures sort of the overall well-being in terms of our heart failure patients. High scores means they're doing well. Low scores means that uh, the heart failure is pretty bad. So let's look at the workflow of the study. So they screened um, 10,500 patients and entered them into the analogical running phase. Okay, and 1,100 patients discontinued. Okay. Uh, about 591 of them for an adverse event, and a few others for various things. So what they found was that 90% of the patients were tolerant to the ACE inhibitor for two weeks and could be on it, which is pretty similar to all the randomized studies that 90% of patients were tolerant ACE inhibition. So then of the 9,400 patients who were left, uh, they entered the uh, Sacubitril Valsartan running phase, and about 977 discontinued again, uh, about 550 of them for an adverse event and a few for various other reasons. So about 90% of these patients could then tolerate being on uh, an RNA, being on the nebulizin inhibitor. So they're left with about 8,400 patients who were then randomized, 4,000 patients to enalapril, 4,000 plus patients to uh, uh, Sacubitril Valsart. So again, largest uh, heart failure study ever done. So who were these patients? So average age was about 63, about 21, 22% were women. Uh, and this is pretty typical for a heart failure uh, trial. Unfortunately, only about 20, 25% of the patients in most heart failure trials uh, were women. Uh, most of the patients, two thirds, were white, with only 5% of the patients being black. This is because uh, most of the patients were enrolled in Europe and uh, Asia, and only about 7% of the patients were enrolled in North America. Blood pressure in the trial was 122 over 72, creatinine was 1.1 for the patients, and average ejection fraction was 29%. Most of the patients in the study were class two and three heart failure. Um, everybody, remember, to get in the trial, you had to be on an ACE or an ARV first, so 100% of patients were on ACE or ARV prior to entry in the trial. But the other medical therapy was outstanding as well. So 80% of patients were on diuretics, mouse here, uh, 30% were on DIG, 93% of patients were on beta blockers, half the patients were on uh, spironolactone. So this is probably the best background medication for any heart failure trial that's ever been done. Now very few patients, only 15%, despite the low ejection fraction, had a defibrillator or a IV pacer, and that's because the study, again, was mostly done in Europe and Asia, where they don't have, for economic reasons, um, Plantation rates of primary prophylaxis ICDs, like we do here in the Americas. So let's look at the, uh, the data here. So here are the Kaplan Meier curves for the primary endpoint. And what you see here is that the patients who got randomized to Sacubitril Valsartan did significantly better okay, uh, in terms of the primary endpoint. 
hazard ratio was 0 0.8, p-value less than 0 0.01. We'll go over the exact value a bit later. So this is for the primary endpoint of death from a cardiovascular cause or hospitalization for heart failure. So now let's look at the individual components. So death from cardiovascular cause, improvement with individual valsartan, hazard ratio exactly the same, 0 0.8, p-value highly significant. Hospitalization for heart failure, again, sacubitril valsartan, beneficial. Hazard ratio, 0 0.79. So exactly the same. This was beneficial across uh, all of the composite points of the endpoint, or excuse me, all the points of the endpoint. Death from any cause, sacubitril valsartan, better. Hazard ratio, 0 0.84. So huge, significant p-value, less than 0 0.001. So patients really benefited from being on this so an endpoint that I get graded on a lot is 30-day uh, readmission rates, and this is looked at all over uh, the U.S. in terms of hospitalization, uh, Medicare reimbursement, and so all the healthcare systems are looking to decrease 30-day readmission rates. So if you were on an alopril or you were on uh, sacubitril valsartan and you had an admission, uh, Akshay Desai, who is the third author on the uh, main study, looked at what was your 30-day readmission rate. And what he found was it was significantly lower for the patients who got sacubitril valsartan by about 4%, which if any of you work on readmission uh, rates for the hospital, uh, that's a huge, huge improvement. It saves a lot of money. So here's the table that shows um, all the exact numbers for the primary outcome. And what I want to do is convert that to the absolute risk reduction. So Absolute risk reduction of 4.7% for that primary outcome of death from cardiovascular disease or hospitalization for heart failure. Absolute risk reduction of 3% for the death. Absolute risk reduction of 3% for the admission. And if you convert that then to number needed to treat, so you need to treat 21 patients with sacubitril valsartan for two years to save one life or present one hospitalization. 31 patients just to save a life, 35 patients just to prevent a hospitalization. So in terms of number needed to treat, these are pretty small numbers. And remember the intervention that we're doing here. We're giving them a pill to take twice a day instead of a different pill that they took twice a day. So unlike all the other heart failure trials that we've been doing for the last several years, decades really, where it's adding on pills on top of other pills or implanting a pacemaker or implanting a defibrillator, it's just switching their one of their medications. So a huge improvement. And when we think about that on a larger patient scale, what if I see 2,000 patients in my office for two years and I switch them to sacubitril valsartan? I'll save 50 lives and about 45 admissions. So that's a huge improvement, again, just by switching the pill. So here's the forest plot uh, over here for the primary endpoint and then for the death from cardiovascular causes. And what you see is it's uh, everything essentially favors uh, sacubitril valsartan for uh, both endpoints, but we'll look at a couple of them specifically. So where the study took place, remember there was only 7% of the patients uh, from North America. They benefited if they're in North America, just like they did if they were in Europe or Asia. Heart, New York Heart Association classification, so if they had really symptomatic class three or four heart failure, they benefited just like if they were mildly symptomatic with class 1 and 2 heart failure. If they had normal kidney function with an estimated GFR greater than 60 versus they had uh, bad kidneys with an EGFR less than 60, they benefited the same amount. If they were above the median blood pressure, they benefited just like if they were below the median blood pressure, again about 122 over 72. And then for the time the patient actually had heart failure. So if the patient was a recent diagnosis of heart failure and had heart failure for less than a year, versus they've had heart failure for one to five years, or heart failure for greater than five years, they benefited the same amount of uh, being on sacubitril valsartan as compared to being on uh, uh, an alopril. So how about the adverse events? Well, there was more uh, hypotension with uh, the sacubitril valsartan. That definitely is true. Renal function-wise, if anything, renal function and potassium uh, favored sacubitril valsartan. There was less uh, elevation in creatinine and less uh, significant hyperkalemia. Uh, as you might expect, being on the ACE inhibitor, there was more ACE inhibitor.
cloth uh, in patients who are on um, an ACE inhibitor. And then as far as angioedema, because they um, uh, had patients on the scutral alsartan, and all these patients who could tolerate the ACE inhibitor had never been on uh, uh, or never had angioedema before, there was very, very low rates of angioedema. So as a result of the Paradigm uh, HF study, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, they updated their clinical guidelines in 2017. And they wrote that patients with chronic symptomatic uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, your heart association class two or three, were most of the patients who were in the study who were tolerant to an ACE inhibitor or ARV. So they're doing just fine on their ACE and ARV, they're just still symptomatic. Replacement by an RNA is recommended to further reduce morbidity and mortality. And they gave that uh, class uh, one recommendation, level of evidence, uh, BR, which basically means that they had one randomized trial, the paradigm study, to, uh, to show this. So really, uh, you know, paradigm shifting uh, this paradigm trial. So let's talk about the nuts and bolts of uh, uh, RNAs. Yeah. So, so just reduced ejection fraction. So even though the trial had lower than 30%, we have all So it was initially 40% and then down to 35 So basically, for purposes of diagnosing heart failure with systolic dysfunction, even though 40 45% is not normal, they generally call that a mid-range ejection fraction. So anybody less than 40%, uh, they would say, based on the guidelines, to put them on. Now, we're currently enrolling patients uh, still in a study looking at diastolic heart failure, multi-center study. Um, they'll have a couple thousand patients to answer, is uh, sacubitral valsart beneficial also in that population? Okay, so uh, practical points. So if you're going to switch someone to sacubitral valsart, you need to be off their ACE inhibitor for 36 hours so that you don't get angioedema. And that's why there's actually not a sacubitril canaloprim uh, pill for them to take and why it's sacubitril valsartan. So remember, um, ACE inhibitors, they not just uh, cause increase in, in or prevent the formation of angiotensin 2, they prevent the breakdown of bradykinin, which leads to cough and angioedema. Now, sacubitril inhibits nephrolysin. Nephrolysin, in addition, breaking down the natriuretic peptides, it breaks down bradykinin. Okay? So if you're going to inhibit nephrolysin, you're going to raise the levels of bradykinin. So if you give someone ACE inhibitor, which raises levels of bradykinin, and you give someone a nephrolysin inhibitor, which raises the levels of bradykinin, that's way too much bradykinin, a relative concentration in the system, and there's unacceptably high rates of angioedema. And they actually tried the uh, pharmaceutical companies making a uh, enalapril, sacubitril uh, compound. And early on in its clinical development, they saw too high rates of angioedema, so it was abandoned and then switched over to Valsart. So uh, if you're going to start, the patient should have an estimated GFR greater than 30 and have adequate blood pressure. What should the starting dose be? So if someone's on the equivalent of uh, less than uh, 10 milligrams BID of enalapril or valsartan, 80 milligrams BID, you should put them on 50 twice a day of uh, the sacubitril valsartan. If on the, on the equivalent of greater than 10 milligrams of enalapril uh, twice a day or greater than uh, 80 milligrams of valsartan twice a day, then they should be started on 100 milligrams BID uh, of uh, uh, sacubitril valsartan. And you're going to want to check the renal function of potassium in two weeks and then see the patient every couple of weeks to up titrate the medications. Now, if you measure uh, the natriuretic peptides, uh, BMP or NT pro BMP, you need to measure the NT pro BMP to be completely 100% accurate. Because depending on the BMP assay that's used, the uh, nephrolysis inhibitor will increase the level of BMP. So, why is that? Again, nephrolysis inhibits. Uh, uh, or causes the breakdown of BMP. So if you give sacubitril, which inhibits nephrolysin, then you're going to have higher concentrations of BMP. So if you use that assay, it's going to be off. But if you use the NT pro BMP assay, which nephrolysin doesn't do anything to that, then you're still going to have an accurate measurement. So um, 
Paradigm's been out now for uh, almost five years, and it's been sort of a slow uptick for a variety of reasons in the use of uh, this really great medicine, the Sikuitra Valsartan. So I want to go over some of the issues with the drug and some of the issues with the trial with you guys. So one issue that comes up uh, is that Paradigm had a run-in period for both drugs. Where the patients had to be on the ACE every for two weeks, had to be on the Sikuitra Valsartan for four to six weeks, then they could be randomized, and it was all for stable outpatients. What about patients who are in the hospital, patients who are acutely decompensated? And we actually um, have some data on this now uh, that helps answer uh, both of these questions. So this is a pioneer study, which was presented at the AHA meeting in November, published simultaneously uh, online in the Medical Journal. And uh, I just want to take a couple minutes to go over this study. So patients uh, over the age of 18, all of them were inpatients admitted for acutely decompensated heart failure. All of them had an EF less than 40 percent. All of them had elevated uh, natriuretic peptides, and they were hemodynamically stable. They had a blood pressure greater than 100. They had no increase in their dose of IV diuretics, so they were decompensated. They were still getting IV diuretics, but they were not escalating dosages. They weren't on any IV vasodilators, and they were off any ionotropes if they had been used for at least 24 hours. The primary outcome was the change in baseline of the NT pro BMP level. So this wasn't a clinical outcome study. This was a seeing, you know, could the uh, NT pro BMP level be decreased? And it had 440 patients who were on, uh, now 440 patients who were on the uh, Sikuvitril Valsartan. Uh, they were randomized a uh, median of 68 hours, so between two and three days after their presentation to the hospital. Now, only two thirds of the patients previously were diagnosed with heart failure. So a third of the patients who got enrolled in the study, they were naive to therapy. So they were getting put on this for the very first time. Half the patients on admission were never treated before with an ACE or ARB. So this will help us answer the question of, well, what about this uh, uh, run-in period? Because the patients had never been uh, exposed to ACE or ARB before half the patients in the study. So Primary outcome, baseline, they all had the same NT pro BMP, but within one week and extending to eight weeks, a bigger drop in your NT pro BMP levels with the Sacubitril Valsartan compared to the Enalapro. Okay. How about safety? Well, really no difference between them in terms of renal function hyperkalemia. In this trial, they really didn't see significantly decreased hypotension. Um, and again, there wasn't anyone hardly who had angioedema except the patients who were naive to ACE inhibitors. We got that for the first time. One thing I want to call your attention to is the exploratory clinical outcomes. Remember, this study wasn't powered to find differences in mortality. It wasn't powered to find differences in hospitalization. So if they find any, it's going to be real because that means there's a really big treatment effect. And what they did find is that the rehospitalization rate for heart failure was dramatically decreased. The hazard ratio was 0.56. So if you put the patients on this while they were acutely decompensated and drive down their NT pro BMP, decrease their filling pressures, decrease the wall stress in the heart, they were unlike or less likely to get readmitted. Again, looking at the forest plots, the patients uh, who got the Sacubitril Valsartan uh, did better overall. I want to draw your attention to a couple of these. Previous use of ACE inhibitor ARB, didn't matter if you were on it before or if this was or if you were completely naive. So this answers the question of that run-in period. So if you had no run-in period and you were getting it for the first time, you did uh, with the uh, uh, Sigmundral Valsartan. How about the patients who were newly diagnosed with heart failure and hadn't been treated with ACE or ARB for years? If you were new diagnosis, again, you did just as well being initially started on the Sigmundral Valsartan. Well, what about the dose? So the average dose was uh, 9.5 milligrams BID of enalapril in Paradigm. So people were saying, well, you probably underdosed it, and that's why you know, the uh, Sacubitril Valsartan was better. And we use dosages of 20 BID uh, when we get them up to the max level. Well, in Paradigm, they used a lower dose because that's what the patients, uh, the, the way the trial was designed. But also, as I told you in the beginning, it doesn't matter if the patient's on 2.5 or 5 milligrams of lisinopril compared to 30 to 40 milligrams, there's going to be the same mortality benefit. And if you look at 
paradigm compared to the other ACE inhibitor trials I showed you, consensus, uh, same, 18.6 milligrams, about 9.5 BID, and even more ACE inhibitors used in paradigm than was used in solid. So it's really not a dosing issue uh, for why you see the benefit of paradigm. Another question comes up, is it applicable to our population here in the U.S.? Again, 7% of the patients only uh, were uh, from North America. And it was. So if you look at these 600-plus uh, patients who are from North America, the hazard ratio was 0.66. 26% of the patients in the North American population were African American, and they had the exact same benefit as the other patients in the trial. In the Pioneer study, which I just showed you, 36% of the patients were African American, and they also had the exact same benefit. If we look at the 15% of patients who had ICDs, hazard ratio 0.5 if you uh, got the secubitral valsartan. So the secubitral valsartan not only prevents death due to worsening heart failure, it actually decreases mortality due to sudden death uh, in the patients who already have a defibrillator. What about uh, the dose of maximizing the ACE or ARB before you put them on the ARB? Do you need to do that? Well, they looked at patients who were underdosed, underdosed with the lower dosing uh, of uh, ACE inhibitor and, uh, before they got uh, up titrated to that 10 milligrams BID. And so they looked at the patients who were switched to enalapril versus patients who were switched to secubitril valsartan. And what they see for the primary endpoint is hazard ratio is exactly the same, 0.82. Hazard ratio is exactly the same, 0.79. So it didn't matter if you initially were on uh, 40 of lisinopril versus if you were on 5 of lisinopril and then got switched over to 10 BID of enalapril. Uh, you had the same benefit. What if you needed to lower the dose of the RNA okay, during the trial? Do you still benefit? Because okay, remember, there was hypotension that they saw. Well, what this graph shows you is that if you were on the full dose of the medication, and this is both the enalapril and the secubitral valsartan, you had a better outcome than if you had to have any dose reduction. Okay. So what this is actually selling us, though, is that if you tolerate higher doses of medicines, you do better than if you tolerate only lower dosages of medications. And that's because the sicker patients do worse. When I have a patient and they have to start peeling back their ACE inhibitor, or peeling back their beta blocker, that's a sign they've reached end stage in the heart failure and not a sign that the medication is failing, per se. And so when they looked at the patients um, and compared those who had a dose reduction of ACE versus the ARNI, and those who did not have dose reduction of ACE versus ARNI, you see the hazard ratio again exactly the same, 0 0.80, 0 0.79, during the secubitral valsartan. Well, you always just say, well, we need another trial. We need another big trial to prove that this wasn't a fluke. And when they designed the trial, the whole reason it was made the biggest trial ever was so that it would be a pivotal trial and they wouldn't have to repeat it. But uh, Milton Packard did a very interesting thing. What he decided to do was, well, let's just take the, the time midpoint of the trial, which was um, uh, December 2011, January 2012, and let's pretend they were two sequential trials. So look at the 3,500 patients who were first enrolled versus the 4,900 patients who were enrolled in the second half of the trial. And what they find is that the hazard ratio is 0.76 with a p-value of 0.004, and that if you look at the second half of the trial, hazard ratio is 0.82 with a p-value of 0.009. So the chances that this was due to statistical flu, just you know, probability that they found these outcomes, was four in a thousand. Okay, if you just have the first half of the trial, nine in a thousand for the second half of the trial. So you lose a lot of the uh, statistical significance, even though it's still highly significant. Remember I told you the initial trial, p-value less than 0 0.001? Well, this was the actual p-value for the trial, 0 0.00000004. So four chances in 10 million that they found this just by statistical chance alone. So to do another trial trying to show the benefit of mutual valsartan really would be unethical when you're seeing a 20% Across the board reduction in these very significant endpoints. And then this other issue comes up. Um, does Arnie's worsen dementia or lead to Alzheimer's? So one of the other molecules that neprilysin inhibits um, or neprilysin breaks down is uh, amyloid. And it's a soluble form of amyloid that it breaks down in the 
nervous system. Now, Alzheimer's are due to soluble, uh, or excuse me, are non-soluble plaques. So it's a completely different molecule, and there's multiple different molecules now like, all over the body. So it's really something very, very different. Um, they looked at rates of dementia. They looked at rates of memory impairment. Uh, median follow-up, 27 months in paradigm, 15 months in this other trial looking at sequential uh, valsartan, and there was no signal for an increase in risk of uh, dementia or memory impairment. Um, I really hate reading long paragraphs of text, but I think it's really important in this case to do that because you know there's such a concern here: dementia, and Alzheimer's. And those are words people see it online and they and they freak out. I don't want to take this drug. So the FDA office of the director. If sacubitril had caused obvious CNS toxicity over the duration of the study, we would have observed a difference in adverse events in this controlled study, given that a large number of patients were exposed to sacubitril over a median of two years, and this study was enriched for patients at higher risk of cognitive dysfunction, median age of 64, with 19%, 800 patients older than 75. The division of neurologic products, even if elevations in amyloid beta should occur with uh, sacubitril valsartan. It's not known if these elevations would impact the risk of developing Alzheimer's. It is even theoretically possible that sacubitril valsartan could have a positive benefit on the vascular contributions to dementia that may balance or outweigh the potential risk of increasing amyloid beta. So the FDA summary statement, at this point, the risk is only theoretical, while the benefit and effect on survival is established. There appears to be general agreement that we do not want to discourage use based on a hypothetical risk particularly in a population with a high competing risk of death. And finally, one last issue for um, uh, Alzheimer's, the ARB recall. Um, if you guys are anything like uh, our offices, we're inundated by calls, you know, our patients on Valsartan, Herbisartan, Candisartan, Closartan. So the Valsartan component of uh, Sacubitril Valsartan, it's not recalled. So this drug is completely fine. There's no issues whatsoever. Um, so one-year survival um, with newly diagnosed heart failure is improved from 40% to 90%. So what happens when medical therapy fails? Well, you need to recognize that uh, it's failed and that uh, they have features of advanced heart failure. And that's where this um, acronym, I Need Help, uh, comes in. And uh, I think it's a really great way to remember the things to look out for. Oh, wait, this patient's got advanced heart failure. Uh, I is for if they've ever needed ionotropes. N for New York Heart Association class or natriuretic peptides being high. E for end organ dysfunction, worsening renal or liver dysfunction. E for ejection fraction being low. E for recurrent defibrillator shock. So even if they're getting appropriate shocks for the defibrillator, that's still a bad prognostic sign. Uh, if they have hospitalizations, if they've got recalcitrant edema or you need to escalate the dose of diuretics, that's a sign they've got advanced heart failure. If they've got low blood pressure um, or you need to back off their prognostically good medicines, so you need to decrease the dose of the ACE, the beta block, or the ARNI, the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist in the Just like in that study that Chara showed you, uh, where if you needed to back off on the dose, everybody did worse. So if you see this, that's a time that a patient really should see a heart failure specialist or go to a heart failure clinic. And here, what we do is we attempt to further medically optimize or use device management or device treatment. We identify true treatment failure. We offer the to investigational therapies as part of research studies. We establish whether they're a suitable candidate for a transplant or for an LVAD. And if they're not, we offer them palliation and uh, help get the, uh, uh, them feeling better and palliated. Uh, Device-based management for heart failure doesn't treat the heart failure per se, but it facilitates or improves treatment. And a really good example of this is our implantable uh, pulmonary pressure monitor, what we call the CardioMEMS device. And it's this really small thing about the size of a paper clip, which when we do a swan dance catheterization, we can put into the pulmonary artery. The patient goes home and they lie down on a pillow once a day and take a measurement of their pulmonary pressure, which then gets transmitted by computer to our offices. And what we see is that as we treat the patient, their pulmonary pressures come down and hopefully remain stable, and this is what the actual tracing will look like. But if we see that it's starting to rise, meaning that the patient is vasoconstricting or the patient is filling up with fluid, we can increase their diuretics, we can increase their vasodilators, and as a result, we can decrease the amount of hospitalizations. This is data from the CHAMPION trial, and decrease the rate of hospitalization and mortality.
and they just presented at ACC uh, two weeks ago, uh, data from the follow-up study for this, and the benefit still holds. Um, other things that can be done if the patient has advanced to end-stage heart failure is left ventricular assist device. This is the old HeartMate 1. This is the HeartMate 2, which is much smaller. This is the pump that Vice President Dick Cheney had. And now we're on to the HeartMate 3, which is the latest generation pump. Uh, last year uh, was uh, published the results of the uh, Momentum 3 study, looking at the new HeartMate 3, the centrifugal flow pump that you see here, versus the HeartMate 2. Uh, my surgical colleague, Danny Goldstein, who um, did his uh, medical school here at Mount Sinai, and uh, my partner, Willie Yorday, were uh, lead authors on the study. Uh, Danny Goldstein was a surgical uh, national PI. And what you see is a huge advantage in survival uh, without strokes due to uh, using the new uh, this generation LVAC. So what this um, uh, graph here uh, shows, uh, this is from, again, my partner, Willie Yorday, is that patients who have end-stage heart failure, if you just continue to treat them with medicines, optimal medical management, they're all dead at two years. Survival's only 8%. And with the old first generation LVAD, survival improved. And then the second generation HeartMate 2, survival improved to 70% in two years. And if you think about that there's no first generation LVADs available anymore, so if you have someone with end stage heart failure and they're, you know, they've seen a heart failure specialist and they come back to see you because they know you for many years, you know, what should I do? They're telling me I should have a pump with a wire coming out and, uh, you know, it may make me live longer, but I don't know if I want to do that. Survival, 70% in two years versus 8%. Okay? So huge, huge, huge survival advantage. And now it's even better because we have the HeartMate 3 available. So um, that's in research study. That's what's published in the literature. There's this thing called Intermax, which is the interagency uh, for, medic, for uh, mechanical assisted circulation where we have to give all our data to every LVAD implanted in the United States to them. And what they do is they publish then what the outcomes are. So success, which is defined as being alive uh, at two years, being transplanted, or having the pump taken out because the heart got better, which rarely happens, um, only about 1%. Overall, 84% of the population has success, does well with this. So at Montefiore, we had 100% success at one year. Okay? So we're really proud of our results. Uh, we're able to keep people alive, feeling better on their LVAD. We're able to get them to transplant. And actually, we have a, a higher rate of uh, explant. Uh, in terms of transplant, our survival, this is all from the uh, SRT, or Scientific Registry for Transplant Recipients report, which is available online. Anyone can look at it. Our survival, 92%, which is better than our peers. Uh, I won't tell you which programs are which. Um, Three-year survival also, 90% better than our peers. So we're very proud of this uh, at our uh, program. So um, take home points I want to leave you guys with. The RNAs, angiotensin, receptor blocker, necrolysin inhibitor, has improved mortality and hospitalization outcomes on top of that provided by ACE inhibitors for heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. The RNAs are well tolerated, similar to ACE inhibitors. There's numerous device management and device treatment options for advanced heart failure. The outcomes for LVADs and heart transplant are outstanding. And if your patients have any of those high-risk features, the I need help features, then think about getting a heart failure consult for them. So with that, I want to thank you guys for uh, being here, for paying attention. I also want to thank Jack and Betsy for uh, playing so nicely together in the cardboard box so that I could put this, uh, these slides together. And uh, thank you all. One or two questions. Quickly, and then you have to come up to the front. I will. I will question. Um, so we probably all each have like a, a small, at least a small handful of patients who would qualify for the, the RD and who are mm -hmm. not actively following with the cardiologist. Mm -hmm. Practically, that we probably should be switching. So practically, um, in your experience, we had a lot of issues, you know, obtaining authorization for the, the medication, or is it fairly straightforward? Sure. So, so that's a, a great question. So it's actually uh, very easy. So um, I checked with our nurses actually yesterday, just because they handle the first phone call uh, often that uh, needs prior approval. So uh, Medicaid approves all of them. Okay. So all the Medicaid, it's not an issue whatsoever. The private insurances, not an issue whatsoever. 
Um, usually it's just a phone call. Um, does the patient have a low ejection fraction? Have they failed ACE inhibitor ARB? And all you have to say is that the patient still has symptomatic uh, heart failure class two or three, and uh, it'll be approved. The only time they are having any problems is uh, for some of the Medicare plans uh, when they're in a donut hole, and then uh, the cost may be prohibitive for the patient depending on what their means are. Now, that said, um, the company um, has a lot of different programs to you know, help offset that copayment uh, for those patients, but Medicaid, no issue, private insurance, no issue. There's another question. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Mo yeah. So as soon as we make a change, uh, we initiate the medicine, or we make a change in the dose, we'll check it within one to two weeks to make sure it's okay. And then if it's not, if their kidney function is normal uh, and they haven't had any issues in the past, every three months. Yes. For the initial trials that we've done with like uh, IV, PNP, like synthetic PNP, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. was the thought that those weren't as positive just because it was like decompensated patients or because it wasn't given with the ARC at the same time? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I, I didn't have time to go into this. So for those of you who, who remember, um, there's a compound called Naziratide, or a brand name called uh, Natricorp, which is recombinant BNP. So it's actually giving patients BNP designed to improve naturesis, cause vasodilation, and it's a treatment that was um, in its uh, clinical trial of VHEF study, uh, or excuse me, VMAX study, uh, looking at decreasing the wedge pressure compared to nitroglycerin. And that was the study that uh, got it approved, and it had a slightly better uh, improvement in wedge pressure, so it really didn't look at clinical outcomes. So when it came into clinical use, they found a lot of hypotension with it. We used to say bolus the naziratide and then started at a trip at whatever rate. We no longer bolus it when we rarely still use it. And we do. There are a few patients in-house who, who benefit. But um, it uh, had that problem with hypotension. Then never in uh, bigger trials with outcomes looking at mortality, it never showed a clinical benefit. So uh, it really wasn't working on the nephrolysin inhibitor part of it, which would affect the angiotensin II. It was just increasing the, the concentration of the BNP. So it was working, you know, via a different pathway, essentially. Uh, I think we have to wrap up. Thank you guys. If you have more questions, please come up to the front. Thanks again. Sure, thanks.